Firstly, I'd like to welcome you to this talk on behalf of the Department of Central, Eastern and Northern European Studies at the University of British Columbia. The university is located on the traditional, ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam speaking people from where I am speaking to you today. Although this talk is taking place in virtual space and connecting the Pacific Northwest with multiple points around the world, I'd like us all to take a moment to reflect on the space we occupy and its problems. This is the first talk in the second term of the inaugural Sovchin Lecture Series in Slavic Studies. For more information about the talks being held in our department, please follow us on Twitter at CNESUBC or visit our website, cines.ubc.ca. More information about the talks coming up this spring in our Sovchin and our Ziegler Lecture Series in Germanic Studies and other events can be found on our website. It's also our pleasure, um, and I kind of have both hats on today, to host this talk alongside the North American Dostoevsky Society, and I'm glad to welcome you on behalf of the Society. This is the third talk in our Bicentennial Speaker Series and the first in 2021, the Dostoevsky Bicentennial Year. More information about the Society's activities are available on our blog, www.bloggerskaramazov.com, including details about future talks and our student essay competitions, which are happening this year. Uh, we also recently launched, alongside the International Dostoevsky Society, our very shiny new website, dostoevsky.org. On the site, you can join the Society or renew your membership and also find out more information about bicentenary events, the newly launched open access e-journal, Dostoevsky Studies, and the 18th International Dostoevsky Symposium, which is planned for 2022 and hosted by our colleagues in Nagoya, Japan. And now to the business at hand, today's talk. I'm handing things over, first of all, to Dorothy Leising, our tech assistant for today, to say a few words about how the Zoom webinar will work. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm speaking to you behind the curtain because I am the tech help here. Um, on the bottom of your screen, you see a Q&A button. In case you have a question that you want Katja to ask the lecturer today, you can push that button, type in your, your question, and afterwards Katja will select questions uh, that will be asked. Next to that button on the bottom, you see three dots that underneath it says more and you see a chat there and maybe you've already noticed that in the chat we've already posted some links to lectures and the Dostoevsky Society or anything that could be of interest. Feel free to engage here with useful links or greetings as well, but um, in case you have a question for the lecturer, please use the Q&A button. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Duarte. Um, and with that, it is my very great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. And I'm really excited about this talk and I'm really glad that you all came to hear it. Um, Dr. Barbara Henry is an associate professor who teaches Russian and Yiddish literature at the University of Washington, Seattle. She's the author of Rewriting Russia, Jacob Gordon's Yiddish Drama, published in 2011, and is completing a study of the classical catabasis in 19th century Russian literature. And today she will present research from this project. Um, her talk today is called Road, River, and Book, The Russian Literary Underworld. And thank you so much, Barbara, for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. I will just do my little screen share here because you don't want to be without a PowerPoint. True. Go. <laughs> okay. Everybody see that? All right, so that's me, that's the title, Road, River, and Book, The Russian Literary Underworld. I'm sure you're familiar with this work. Uh, it's a pale road stretching before us into the measureless gray distance where sky and earth merge. Empty fields and distant forests that seem to rival the sky in their immensity. Someone in black, waits by the little roadside chapel that marks the Akolitsa, the edge of a town, of a village, of the known world. A gleaming white church in a clearing beyond the forest is far, far away, and the road to its doors not evident. Even if you don't know that Isak Levitan's Vladimirka is the road walked by convicts to Siberia, the image is a mournful one. Um, even in midday, even in summer, even when the way is clear, because we instinctively know where that road is going. We may call it Siberia, we may call it the other side or the undiscovered country, but we know that Vladimirka Road ends in the land of the dead. 
The story of the journey to that world, the Catabasis, is one of the oldest that we tell. Uh, in the underworld, you can acquire various things. Um, Gilgamesh seeks immortality. Odysseus, prophecy from Tiresias. Uh, Inanna, Psyche, Orpheus make the descent to get precious objects, retrieve loved ones. All are transformed by the journey uh, because who would not be after meeting death in its own kingdom? So familiar with the tropes of the catabasis that Aristophanes and Lucian could mine it for comedy. Virgil attached the fate of the nation to his hero's descent. Freud likened the catabasis to psychoanalysis uh, with the underworld representing the dreaming subconscious mind. Today, the catabasis seems to be omnipresent in novels, films especially, comics, uh, even video games. Um, it offers a familiar but highly adaptable framework for addressing questions about mortality, mental illness, grief, trauma. Um, and my project examines the catabasis in Russian literature how it's localized and changes over time, how it differs from European models, and what it brings to the process of literary evolution. Um, the descent motif tends to emerge with particular urgency in times of crisis and change, um, both artistic and historical. And it's one way of processing, I suppose, the fear and exhilaration that accompanies such shifts, whether that shift is when poetry cedes preeminence to prose or you emancipate 23 million serfs. Uh, one striking aspect of the Russian catabasis is that it generally lacks the verticality of the European model, which is most famous, of course, in Dante's Inferno. Uh, this is Gustave Doré's uh, illustrations to the Inferno, and he really gets that verticality in there. The orientation of the Russian catabasis tends to be lateral, uh, reflecting both native geography and a psychic ideal. Uh, the open level planes of the steppe serve as the imaginative basis for what Yuri Lotman called a kind of ethics. The leveling extends to who can make the descent, uh, which in Russian literature has never been uh, the sole preserve of demigods and noble heroes. Vasilisa the Beautiful, uh, Pilevans, Pyotr Pustata, uh, their descent heroes as valid as Pichorin or indeed Alexander Garyanchikov. And this democratic aspect of the Russian descent actually puts the nobleman narrator of Notes from the House of the Dead at kind of a disadvantage. Uh, Garyanchikov's dramatic fall in social and civil status, his suddenly becoming what he says one of the common class, uh, a convict like them, is essential because his elevated status as a nobleman itself represents an impediment to his psychic transformation. <coughs> it's only in prison that Garyanchikov becomes aware of the deepest chasm that separates the nobility and the peasantry, even as he is transformed, as he says, uh, from one into the other. And the phrase that he uses to describe this alienation, uh, evokes depths to underline its unnatural, un-Russian character. All such depths and the corresponding heights that they imply are aberrant because they bolster illusions of inferiority and superiority. And this applies whether the depths are the subterranean afterlife of Babok or the underground man's rancid view from his mental crawl space. Uh, and it applies conversely uh, to the fatal pitch of the gentle creature's leap from her open window or Raskolnikov's coffin-like attic room. Depths and heights alike thwart the transcendent possibilities of the open road, the clear field, and the broad river of the Russian catabasis. Even those in, who are born to flight in Notes from the House of the Dead, like the many eagles that proliferate, are brought low. <coughs> the actual eagle uh, with the injured wing leaves the prison on foot, his head bobbing through the grass as the convicts watch. Uh, the famous thief, Arlov, 
whose strength and vitality astonish Garenchikov, dies in hospital after a horrific flogging. The Lieutenant Colonel G, whom the prisoners pronounce an eagle, uh, is summarily dismissed by the major. And of course, most tragic is Aquilina, whose Latin derived name means aquiline, like an eagle. She is accordingly slaughtered like a bird. And this too is the leveling affected by the catabasis. It's an equalizer that can be used as a democratizing force or as a means of degrading what has been elevated by gods and men. And of course, these equalizing properties inevitably figure in the novel's political dimension, which pointedly aligns the fate of the prison with the fate of Russia itself. Uh, we're told at the outset that every province, every region of Russia had some representative there. Uh, and the sins of empire and the corruption of serfdom are everywhere apparent in the prison. Uh, when change does come in chapter nine with the removal of the loathsome major, um, there's hope that the prison, the nation can be lifted from its degradation, uh, that old wrongs can be righted and sinners can be resurrected from the dead. Um, and the question of resurrection echoes larger contemporary forces at the time of the novel's initial serialization in 1860. Uh, the 1861 manifesto, Emancipating the Serfs, itself speaks the language of the sacred. Uh, it notes the fallen state of the relationship between the nobility and the peasantry, um, and asserts that the improvement of the serfs' lot is one that divine providence demands. Uh, the changes instituted in the prison in part two of the novel, after a tyrant has departed and there has been a significant restructuring um, under the new commander, clearly alludes to the great reforms of Alexander II. But Garyanchikov notes, Для нас жизнь продолжалась в сущности по-прежнему, то же содержание, та же работа и почти те же порядки. Только начальство изменилось и усложнилось. This might be the most laconic understatement ever uh, of the results of the emancipation. Uh, not much change, there are just a whole lot more bosses to answer to. Um, the failure of the prison break that follows the restructuring as two inmates enact their own emancipation uh, suggests that the equalizing potential of the great reforms would have to come from somewhere else. Um, and this is where the Siberian underworld of Garyanchikov's uh, prison plays an essential role. Um, certainly the satanic hells that are detailed in Orthodox Apocrypha, like the descent of the Virgin to hell uh, and Dante's Inferno are obvious reference, reference points for Garyanchikov's de dead house. Um, but I think it owes at least as much to folkloric and classical models of the underworld as it does to Christian ones. Um, most of us are familiar with the medieval Christian conception of hell as a place of suffering and eternal punishment from which release was unlikely. And of course I had to use this image. Um, but classical and folkloric underworlds have different dimensions. And I want to talk about two aspects of these that are relevant not only to notes from the House of the Dead, uh, but to Dostoevsky's work generally, even before exile. And these are the underworld's generation of temporal distortions uh, and the doublings and repetitions that proceed from these. Um, sorry, I lost my place. Um, so the pagan underworld um, is not a place exclusively of punishment. Um, it's for both punishment and reward. Uh, and it has corresponding regions, Tartarus, the meadows of Asphodel, Elysium for the bad, the merely okay, uh, and the good. And the purpose of the pagan un underworld, which evolves over time, of course, uh, is to prepare souls for reincarnation. It's a sacred realm, and for the most part, it's a place of purification, uh, where you see and choose your future life, as in Plato's idiosyncratic uh, story of Ur. In these underworlds, the dead, 
the living descent hero and the unborn, representing the past, present, and the future, exist simultaneously, uh, interacting on the same plane. The underworld offers retrospective prophecy. This is vision that looks forward as it looks back. Uh, Virgil's underworld is, is typical of this in that Aeneas's future descendants, whom he's shown in the parade of heroes by his late father Anchises, are actually the ancestors of Virgil's contemporary Roman readers. And this kind of temporal overlap can be conveyed in character, in verbal aspect and mood uh, by detaching fabula from sujet so that the future can come before the past and the present. Events can be repeated and reordered, uh, suggesting time's suspension, subjectivity, and possibly reversal. And since events can be repeated, people can be too. Uh, doubles proliferate, embodying different versions of the same character through time. In Notes from the House of the Dead, the prison is enclosed not only by physical boundaries, by the walls, fences, gates, and barracks, but by formal literary elements as well that demarcate generic and temporal borders. <clears throat> the found manuscript, about which I have a whole chapter, um, which is a distinctly modern underworld uh, gateway, is introduced in the prologue and isolates Garyanchikov uh, in time as a dead man, as a story as a dead man's tale, and the prison is a dead man's world. Time in the prison is contained and concentrated. Uh, in Bakhtin's terms, it takes on flesh, becomes artistically visible. Time is visible on the convicts' branded faces, which announce their crimes, and thus the time that they serve. Time is visible in the guards, who walk the high circular earthen wall uh, around the prison, turning like the hands on a clock face. Time is visible for the prisoner, who, like Dostoevsky himself, counts the wooden posts of the palisade to number the days of his sentence. Time in the prison is elongated, but it's also weirdly compressed. We have three chapters, all called first impressions. There are two first months, uh, but the whole of part one takes place just over about three weeks. Uh, and as Garyanshikov shows us around his new home, uh, there are time markers in his speech, like always and once and sometimes and never, which hint at the long years that he's actually spent there. He provides his own description of these properties when he refers to his years of incarceration as a recent long ago time, the nedavne davno prashedshe vrimya. As past, present and future overlap, Garyanchikov's earliest days merge with his later ones. Separate times flow together so that there are both 250 inmates in the prison and also only 200. The December in which Garyanchikov arrives and when he leaves are one and the same, but also separated by a decade, connected as they are by mythic time that is circular rather than linear. The Slavna Minuta, the glorious moment that he enjoys in the novel's last line, constitutes the whole measure of Garyanchikov's freedom before death claims him in the novel's prologue. As one who has eaten the food of the dead, Garyanchikov can never really leave the underworld. The bathhouse scene, which makes a literally naked parallel with Dante's hell, takes place outside the dead house, uh, suggests the prison's expanding borders. Uh, it actually eventually escapes the boundaries of the novel entirely, resurfacing in 1873 in the sketch environment, and again in 1876 in Mujik Marie. In Marie, we have a fictionalized Dostoevsky who recalls his own childhood self, uh, an innocent double who dwells deep in his subconscious mind. The double is a traditional element of catabatic texts that embodies the very idea of the underworld as a shadowy reflection of our own. Notes from the House of the Dead, like most Dostoevsky works, is rich in doubles, beginning with the prison itself, which is a kind of dark twin to Russia, and Garyanchikov, who is a presumed or authorial double. However, Garyanchikov has his own doubles, 
Um, and they allow us to see him as the other inmates do, uh, but also to see different versions of him in time. One notable double is Petrov. Uh, he's this strange guy who seeks out Garyanshikov when Garyanshikov is trying to get away from everybody on Sundays, walking behind the barracks. Uh, and he's always asking odd questions. And Garyanshikov insists a little too strenuously that there obviously could be no kind of connection between us. There's absolutely nothing we had in common, nor could there be. It's very emphatic. But Petrov's name suggests a paternal relationship with Alexander Petrovich, underlined by Petrov's regarding him as a sort of child, almost a baby, whose little feet uh, Petrov famously washes in the bathhouse. Petrov causes Garyanshikov discomfort because passions were latent in him and even violent burning ones. Uh, but the fiery embers were always dusted with ash and smoldered quietly. The likening of Petrov's true nature uh, to something burning, Garyachev, uh, reinforces his similarity to Garyanshikov, whose own passions boiled over once as well. Um, generally, people are reluctant, as is Garyachikov, to acknowledge the murder that landed Garyachikov in prison. Uh, and this reluctance necessitates the creation of more doubles. And the manufacture of them is one that scholars and readers have certainly abetted. Um, we prefer to see the murder as merely Dostoevsky's uh, effort to elude censorship. Uh, references to political prisoners as us uh, have fueled a preference for seeing Garyanshikov not as a felon, but as a prisoner of conscience. Garyanshikov himself would so like to be seen as a political that the closest thing that the novel offers to his confession uh, has to be extracted by fevered delirium, a Garyanshikov small. Garyanshikov's most odious double is Shishkov, uh, the sociopath peasant storyteller of uh, Akulka's husband, Akulkin Nur. In the prison hospital, Garyanchika explains that The larger novel itself is a frame for Akulka's husband which is a kind of found text on its own that internally reduplicates the larger framing structure of the found manuscript. And its buried depths, at the very core, like the uh, soul of Cachet, um, reminds us that the dreaming and subconscious minds are underworlds of their own from whose truths none can hide for long. Shishkov and Garyanchikov effectively provide the only voice that Akulina has and this act of ventriloquism offers an oblique view of Garyanshikov's crime, which, though not premeditated, had the same end result as Shishkov's crime. And retelling the story, I think, is a kind of penance for Garyanshikov. And it also aligns him with Akulka, suggesting that, like Raskolnikov, Garyanshikov murdered himself as well. And immediately after making this confession, everything sort of brightens in the novel. Uh, Easter and spring approach, uh, and Garyanchika finds, I still wanted to live after prison. And it's set apart in a paragraph of its own as if he's almost surprised by this. And the real realization follows a view of the steppe, the sky, and the river. Early discussion of the landscape uh, and river is connected only with work when inmates are sent to the frozen wa waters uh, to break up a derelict barge, a task that underlines the futility of escape. Пришли на берег, внизу на реке стояла замерзшая в воде старая барка, которую надо было ломать. На той стороне реки синела степь. The view is grim, the description is terse, but looking to what lies on the other side of the river invites consideration of a life beyond the prison. Uh, the deep blue ceiling of, of the steppe 
links it visually with the sky and its reflection in the Irtish. This is actually a picture of the Irtish. The sky itself is a kind of river in the inverted world that Garyanchikov inhabits. He's like Sadko looking up the waters above him. The sky is the only exception to the perils of heights in uh, Notes from the House of the Dead, because it's of course the heavens, it's a divine space. The color of the blue step lends it a sacred value as well, but it's one that's attainable by virtue of the lateral earthbound path to it. And of course, the etymological connection of Pustinli, uninhabited, with Pustium, monastery, uh, emphasizes uh, the sacred, their sacred similarities. And the association is made specific in the chapter entitled Summertime. Я потому так часто говорю об этом береге, что единственный токе с него и был виден мир Божий. Чистая, ясная даль, незаселенная, вольная степи, производившая на меня странное впечатление своей пустынностью. На берегу толки можно было стать крепостью задом и не видать ее. Even before this, though, the landscape has a transformative effect on Gedeonchikov. It's in comp contemplating the river that he actually observes some positive traits in his fellow inmates. Uh, as Robin Foyer Miller has noted, uh, Gedeonchikov's river scenes are essentially repeated in the epilogue to Crime and Punishment, right down to the alabaster kiln. And the river that separates the living and the dead uh, is many things. It's a border, but it's also a means of cleansing and transformation. It also suggests creative flow that comes from somewhere unseen, takes different shapes as it heads to sea, where it will form something entirely new. And this generative process owes also to the water's reflective capacities, which lead to the creation of Garyanchikov's last and most important double. When Garyanchikov leaves the prison, um, it's in the company, we're told, of a comrade, Tavarish, with whom he entered the prison. But there is no such Tavarish in the initial description of his arrival. Uh, the gate is open specifically to me, not us. In first impressions, we're told that there are four other Russian noblemen in the prison besides Garyanchikov. One is the informant with whom Garyanchikov has no contact at all. The second is the patricide, the guy who is pr proven innocent. The third is Akim Akimich, and the fourth is not named. By chapter seven of part one, this nameless fourth nobleman's condition has deteriorated. Я с ужасом смотрел на одного из моих товарищей, как он гас в остроге, как свечка. Пошел он в его вместе со мною, еще молодой, красивый, бодрый. А вышел полуразрушенный, седой, без ног, с задышкой. Нет, думал я, я не его гляда, я, не, я хочу жить и буду жить. He then escapes Garanchikov's mental accounting entirely in chapter 8, part 2, um, and reduces the number of noblemen to three. Then he rematerializes 10 years later in Taborsk prior to Garyanchikov's arriving uh, in prison. And the mysterious nobleman's similarity to Garyanchikov is underlined by his identical uniform, identical treatment by, by and responses to the major's questions, and his being stripped of all his personal possessions in the same fashion. Then this comrade reappears in the final chapter to leave the prison with Garyanchikov. And they even live together, we're told, for a month after their release. And then he's mentioned no more. Is he a mirror of Garyanchikov, a shadow? Given the tendency in the underworld of the future to affect events of the past, this mysterious comrade may be someone not of this time or place or even this novel. Maybe he is the future. Maybe he is Raskolnikov himself. Because Garyanchikov cannot leave the prison alone. He has never been alone, even when it's all that he wanted. And certainly not now that he sees that his fate is inseparable from that of his people. It can happen in this Siberian underworld, whose river, sky, and distant blue steppe allow for transformation, prophetic vision, and reincarnation. 
Negotiating between the punitive and transformative aspects of the underworld creates a fertile tension in Dostoevsky's most explicitly catabatic text. And yet this supernatural element is largely subordinated in critical reception to the novel's autobiographical origins and social conscience. Not even Tolstoy noticed that Notes from the House of the Dead effectively smuggles supernatural content into a work of realist fiction. And I think the implications of Dostoevsky's subversive fantastical realism represent an advancement on the kind of events that we see in a work like Gogol's Overcoat. In Gogol's story, of course, the, the waiting darkness on the other side of the Abukhov bridge is waved away with a desperately fantastical plot twist. But in Dostoevsky's Dead House, the supernatural dons a responsible, politically engaged mask. It bears witness to real injustice while simultaneously distracting us from the unsettling proximity of the kingdom of the dead. It's not confined to Siberia now. It's in St. Petersburg. It's in the attic. It's in your own head. Since escape is no longer possible, the challenge now is not to leave the underworld, but to live in it. At least we have a guide. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Barbara. I was muted. Uh, that was um, fantastic. And so um, now I'm going to open it up to questions. If anyone has a question, um, you can share it in the Q&A or share it in the chat. Um, Q&A preferred, but either is fine. And um, we will get started. I have a question, but I might let other people ask first. Okay, I will ask first, um, but I apologize in advance because I'm afraid that my question might be um, ambitious, but it's what I was thinking of when I was listening to your talk, which is that uh, you rightly point out that the Katabasis narrative structure seems to take place in a lot of different of Dostoevsky's texts. So um, we see it for sure in Crime and Punishment. Um, we see it in Notes from Underground. Um, I see it a lot of places now that you've pointed it out, and I would argue maybe in all of Dostoevsky's novels. Um, mm -hmm. And that I find to be really interesting, and it totally makes sense for Dostoevsky coming as he is from um, his background and what he's particularly interested in looking at with his novelistic craft. Um, but what, what I'm interested in knowing is how do you reconcile all of these catabatic narratives across Dostoevsky's oeuvre. Do you find them all as powerful? I know you said that the most catabastic one is um, Notes from the House of the Dead, but do you find that the others are doing other things? Or do you find that there's a kind of an evolution or a development across Dostoevsky's art? And I really do apologize for asking a question about all of the books. <laughs> you, you could easily write just about this motif in Dostoevsky and it would be a really big book. Um, yeah. I see it's there certainly before he goes to Siberia. It's it's in Belyanoichi, which is, you know, everyone thinks it's the sort of happy romance. Mm, no. <laughs> the temporal stuff going up on the, in the attic and that last page is, is underworldly. Um, it's it's there throughout. Um, and I think in, it's in the double, certainly, but mm -hmm. in Petersburg is what generates this. But it, originally it's, I think he's borrowing things from, from Gogol. Mm -hmm. um, and then he, he, what happens here is he, he develops his own chronotope of, of the catalysis. Um, and I think it's, it's explicit in, I mean, it's in the title of Notes from the House of the Dead, but I don't know that it's the most underworldly. I would say probably Crime and Punishment is, mm -hmm. um, and certainly um, Notes uh, from Underground, the Underground is, is, is related to that. I think it's, it's, the fact that I didn't really talk about the road aspect of it. And I think all the roads from the House of the Dead lead to crime and punishment. Mm -hmm. um, and sure. and, and uh, St. Petersburg is, is it's, ex it's explicitly hell. Um, and there, the, the prison is, is redemption. It's almost more like a positive, a positive kind of underworld because it's already been in Tartarus, which is St. Petersburg. Mm -hmm. But um, 
I, I, he treats it comically sometimes too. I mean, um, I first time I read Babok, I thought it was hilarious. Um, and, <laughs> and and there it's I mean they're literally underground. Um, he's constantly dealing with with this question because it's the biggest question. You know, where, where do we go when we're we're done here? I mean, do we go anywhere? Is there anything? It's the biggest question. It's the oldest story, and I think the question that most obsesses him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And of course, we will never know until we get there ourselves. So. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, okay, we have a question from Susana Fuentes. Uh, she says, hello, thank you for your talk. Very nice, all the images and this final shift in new beginning. How would you describe the horizontality now in the attic in this new catabasis in Petersburg? Um, I think because it is this sort of circular cycle, I think all the characters have to go through it from the beginning. Um, and uh, um, Raskolnikov doesn't get to that point until he leaves St. Petersburg. I mean, he gets sort of, he gets these moments of truth when he stands by the canal, right? He like perches on, he's standing just after he's committed the murder and he's like, should I, should I go turn myself in? He's there by the water. The water always provokes this sort of reflective truth capacity that he has. Uh, but it isn't until he actually gets out to the, the Russian landscape, the Russian countryside, um, with this vast, magnificent sky, um, that he gets into his actual transformation. Mm -hmm. He's in hell. You can spend a great deal of time in hell. I mean, there, there are Greek myths that have pe people go down, they don't always come back. You know, um, Perithus never comes back. He's like stuck on a chair in eternity in Hades. So <laughs> you, you can spend a lot of time there. You can even come from there. Um, and the way to get out is to get into that, that lateral aspect, that get onto the road, cross the water. And Garyanchuk himself may not ever cross the water. Maybe he never crosses the Irtish. Um, I think for someone like Raskolnikov, it's, it's implicit that he does. I think he does, you know, I think it is a happy ending as far as you can get with Dostoevsky. Um, but um, until you, you've made that lateral move, you're not going to go anywhere. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. Um, and particularly thinking about how claustrophobic St. Petersburg is. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. hells are always claustrophobic. The, the, the Tartarus part of, of Dostoevsky's underworld is always closed, like Svidrigailov's Banya or um, uh, Fyodor Karamazov, you know, where do they get the hooks? I mean, you imagine like these low, this low ceiling in hell with hooks that he, that people yeah. get hanged on. Um, I mean, Rusko and Lecup's horrible room, the, the dreamer's horrible, dusty, dirty attic. It's always enclosed, the dushnata of, of the, the barracks at night. Um, openness though, you know, that's where your redemption lies. Yes, unless you're agoraphobic. <laughs> um, Kate asks a question about the catabastic narratives in Brothers Karamazov, um, which are more explicitly connected to characters from the Narod, the coachman Andre and Mitya, Grushenka's onion tale. What is the significance of these final examples in Dostoevsky's oeuvre? Oh, that's a really good question. And I'm, I'm about halfway through um, the, this book by, um, oh God, I can't remember it. It's, it's uh, the Dostoevsky and the Russian people. Um, and how, I don't know that he thinks that they have a fundamentally different way of approaching this, this mm -hmm. underworld because they're already equal as it is. Um, what, what's curious is to see how women go through it. I mean, you, they don't get as much focus like, like Sonia or, or Grusha. Um, but yeah, I haven't looked as much as I should at, at Brothers Karamazov, um, but I mean, that's the apotheosis of it, right? Um, but that, that's a good question. I, I'm not sure I can say, I'm not sure I can say. Um, so we have a question from Alison Knight who says, thank you so much, Barbara. I was wondering if you see the potential lateral transformation for any women or if it's mostly afforded to men. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, the, the assumption is because there are fewer female descent stories that they're there. I mean, Inanna, the, you know, the Sumerian goddess goes down, she's, she actually dies in the underworld and is resurrected. So she's like this proto Jesus figure. Um, 
there, there are women's descent stories, but they tend to be more about finding yourself in the underworld, finding that that the part of you that is is healed or is it makes you complete. Um, they tend to be less about doing battle and and overcoming your demons. Um, but yeah, I mean, I keep coming back to Sonia because Sonia is like one of the, or maybe Nastasya Filipovna in, in The Idiot. Um, women's descent stories are a little bit different. And I mean, and I'm not sure that Dostoevsky focuses so much on female characters to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, I think you would need to look to other, other maybe women writers. I think of um, The Vainaya Gizem, Mm -hmm. uh, where it's got the the underworld is this poetic dream that this this young woman has, uh, but women underworld women's underworld stories are are a little bit different. They tend to be, and I, I think they are in Dostoevsky as well. Good. I have a um, question that takes us off in a different path, um, but if anyone else has questions that are related to this, please feel free to ask, and we'll go right back on this path um, afterwards. So my question is, I also struggle with a thing that you seem to be struggling with, which is that um, I put Dostoevsky in my book and Dostoevsky threatens to take over the whole book. You could write an entire book on the topic and oh, Dostoevsky. Yeah. Uh, so my book is about the Gothic um, and how it impacts realism. And that, uh, <laughs> that is a huge topic for Dostoevsky in particular, right? As well as all of the other people in my book who struggle with Dostoevsky for um, pride of place. And I was wondering how you deal with that tension between Dostoevsky wanting to take over your whole book, or maybe Gogol wanting to take over your whole book, and everybody else that needs to go in the book. Well, I, I left Dostoevsky for later in, in the composition of the book. I started with Bulgakov, um, and then I moved back to folk tales and, and Pushkin. Um, and then finally, I'm like approaching from behind, like sort of pincer movement. Um, but he does, I mean, once you start, once you see it, you, and he, he, you know, shows you right there, it's right yeah. there, what you're looking for. Um, and, and I think I've, I've sort of limited the works, my, my organizing principle was I was looking at inflection points, like every 30 years, we get these, these, these things. So I have Povesti Belkina, and then I have uh, Zapisky's Murta Doma, um, and then the journey to Sakhalin and notes of a young doctor. So it's every 30 years this seems to come up with particular urgency. Um, and so I, I have a temporal way of demarcating <laughs> Dostoevsky because, you know, and I know the chapter is just gonna be mostly footnotes about things that I, I couldn't address. But I also wanted to look at works that were maybe studied a little bit less than, than the big four novels. Um, so, if you if you figure out how to have you figured out how to stop him from taking over everything well when I started he had one chapter and now he has four so no <laughs> not there yet um, just surrender do we just give in is it like you know I just, yeah. just, give in. just give in just give in or write the longest book in the world <laughs> <laughs> yes no one writes a slim volume about it. no um other questions Kate says submit <laughs> but all the Stavsky Katabasis book. <laughs> yeah, totally. Really cheerful too. Oh yeah. And that's, I don't get to talk about how funny it is. Like it's funny in Pushkin. It's it's funny in Bulgakov. <laughs> and it's funny in Aristophanes. So mm -hmm. it can be funny. It can be funny. Well, and Dostoevsky is very funny. Not always, but a lot of the time. Right? There, there is there is that my the first time he introduces the river in in uh, notes from the house of the dead it's a summer scene of it's like a romantic scene with a prostitute who's extremely dirty <laughs> and he's just look and again is just looking at the this this at this, this romantic assignation by the river and it's not ennobled at all but <laughs> it's just she was very dirty <laughs> um other questions <laughs> Barbara's eyeing the Q and A, which uh, has no other questions. Um, I think I think that uh, if there are no other questions, or if you're in the process of asking a question, if you want to put your hand up so we know it's coming, that would be helpful. 
Oh, wait, um, Susana Fuentes has a question, which is, Barbara, when is the book coming? The oh, question we all want to know. It's a few, I have another nine months on my sabbatical, by which time, inshallah, it'll be done. Um, and um, I got to shop it. I got to start shopping into publishers soon. So I don't know. I don't know. Uh, so to be determined. To, to be determined. Um, oh, and Shoshana Schwebel has put her hand up. So we'll wait for her question um, just for a little bit longer. Um, some people in the chat are saying thank you. And uh, Elizaveta Shikova has pointed out that the weather in St. Petersburg is showing colors, <laughs> which we can all agree with. Yes, yes. We yes. can all agree with. <laughs> um, Mosquitoes right. the size of golden retrievers. Here is Shoshana's question. Um, she says, that was amazing. Thank you so much. I'm wondering if you could speak a bit more about the attic if we have time. Is it an inverted underworld? Shoshana, do you want me to unmute you? Um, not particularly. <laughs> okay. Well, the attic, I mean, I think the, the attic is, is the implied opposite to, to the, the lower depths, the underworld, um, because you can't have anything that's deep without having something correspondingly high. Um, and in that respect, it's, it's just as bad, um, especially because it's hot, uh, it's dirty. Um, and I, I think that the, the attic is, is, you know, like all of these interior spaces, they're all just a depiction of the character's own head. Um, the attic is your head. Um, and it's full of spiders and dust and, and you can't avoid it then. Um, because I mean, this, and this is very much a, a modern, modern idea that, that Freud and Jung deal with that, that the underworld is, is depression. It's, it's the subconscious mind, it's the dream state. Um, and there's no way you can get away from that. That's in your head now. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons we see, see so many of these horrible addicts. Um, I mean, is the underground man himself actually in an attic or is it, I don't even think it's subterranean. I think it's, it's condition is subterranean. It's a um, suite of rooms, but he definitely has, um, when people come to visit him, they have to go downstairs to get out. Okay. But I don't think it's an attic. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're both as bad as can be because again, they're not this level leveling playing field. It's not this, this open plane where you can see everything coming. Um, and I think about um, another aspect of this lateral catabasis is very much a folkloric one because the chista polia, um, it's either a cultivated field or it's a stip, um, but it's always this open space where you can see, you can see your enemies coming. You know what's out there. Uh, everything is, is visible um, and you enter this field of battle to do you know, I don't know, to kill a three-headed dragon, seven-headed dragon, or your own, your own neuroses. Um, but if you're up or below, you can't do that, so. We have a question, a follow-up question from Kate who asks, what about the tavern? Is that also connected to the underworld? And she's well, in, in, in Gilgamesh it is. There, there's a tavern in the Babylonian underworld. The, the alewife Siduri is like, who the hell is that coming along? Um, so the tavern is, I mean, the tavern, yeah, that's a great question. I hadn't thought about that. Because then you've got alcohol, scandal, performance. Yeah. Well, and also you have all those scenes in Crime and Punishment where Raskolnikov is going to meet with Svibrigailov in random taverns, like he's being haunted in the tavern. Yeah, yeah Kate says, by way of Svibrigailov. Yeah, yeah. It all goes back to the bathhouse with the spiders, <laughs> always. Oh. Which is really, I mean, that that's that's got to be my image too. It's it's hot, it's dirty, and it's got spiders. I mean, I, I don't think there's a more vivid. That's actually a lot like the underworld that uh, in Gilgamesh that that Enkidu dreams of. Mm -hmm. You know, you're just in this dark house eating dust all day. Susanna mm -hmm. points out Steppenwolf, maybe the tavern. Ah, yeah. ah. interesting, interesting. Yeah. Um, I think tavern. That's good. Definitely, definitely. Uh, the image that always comes to mind me, uh, Kate says the Crystal Palace Tavern connecting to notes from underground. It's all about the Crystal Palace. Um, a Zoom background I rejected for today. I should have put it up. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, um, the thing that I always think of by way of the, the bathhouse that's full of spiders is the horrible scene of Smerdyakov's 
wallpaper with so many uh, cockroaches behind it that it rustles and like undulates, which is just- That's horror movie. That's a horror movie detail. Absolutely. Um, but my book's <laughs> a little more gothic. Um, <laughs> Anne Lonsbury says, yes, heat, filth, and lots of spiders close together. That is hell. Absolutely, Anne. <laughs> that is hell. Um, other questions? Comments? Depictions of insects in Dostoevsky? <laughs> oh. Uh, Anne asks, anything else about the road? Yeah, the road is, there's almost a sort of magical thing that happens in, in this novel in that uh, we don't ever see the road. Um, we don't see, because then, I, I don't know if he would have walked it, if Garanchkov as a nobleman would have taken a carriage like Dostoevsky did, or he would have walked it like a common criminal. But we don't see the road, and that's part of the problem. Mm -hmm. um, he's just there magically. And there's this, this thing in folk tales, which uh, Prop calls the this sort of motion that, that takes you from one place to another. Um, and Gerenshkov is just kind of there. So the road that he needs to take uh, is still at, is taking place after the novel, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it, it goes straight to crime and punishment. Um, mm -hmm. The road is, is this thing, you have to have a road in a story. I mean, it's where you meet your destiny. It's, it's where you run into a dragon that shows you where your bride is. Um, you got to you gotta have a road. Um, and the fact that Garenshkov doesn't have one is part of the problem. He's, he's got the water and he's got the, the found manuscript, which itself is, is a, a possibly unique uh, Russian aspect to an underworld. And of course, we, we have Pushkin to thank for that one in Povesti Velkina. Interesting, interesting. Um, so I think, I think on that note, we will end, but this has been really, oh, wait, one more question. So many questions, this is great. Um, Susanna asks, have you worked about different paintings of Russian landscape? It was great that you described the road to Siberia or to the underworld. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I actually look at a lot of, of paintings of, of landscape. Um, and the thing with Levitan especially is that it's always there, that, that sadness, mm -hmm. that, that feeling of, of time running out. Um, and the Vladimir kit for me, I've, I've been trying for years to get that as a book cover and I think I'm finally going to manage. Um, but it's um, a book about the underworld. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I wanted it for my first book, and my editor was like, you know, it's beautiful, but everyone wants to cry when they look at it. <laughs> and that's not going to sell books. Um, but uh, the landscape itself is just, I mean, I when I was going through looking for all these pictures of the steppe, I mean, I could do that for hours because it's just, it's just. Siberia is magnificently beautiful. Um, and that that transcendent beauty is something that, that Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, I think, find uh, alike in this in this landscape. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, the, it, and it's a it's a great excuse to look at pictures and paintings. Okay. Any more questions? Susanna says amazing. I think so too. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's nice talking about it. I've been in my own head for a long time with it. So. No, this has been really fun. And I have a lot of, I have a lot of ideas. Like I feel very excited about the conversation that we've had. I hope other people do as well. Um, so unless I get interrupted with another question last minute, um, Anne says lots to think about, extremely interesting. Yeah, definitely. Um, Barbara, thank you so much for speaking today. Um, the talk will be recorded, it has been recorded and it'll be up on um, my institution's repository, and we will share details about that um, through our Dostoevsky Society social media channels and through my department's social media channels. And um, let's all cheer for Barbara's book, which will hopefully be out in the near future. Yay. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Dorothy, for posting that. Uh, note to where we can find recordings from the rest of the series. Okay, on that note, I'm going to end things, um, but thank you all for coming. This has been great. Um, and thank you, Barbara, one more time. And uh, please do come to future talks. <laughs>